You're listening to the Culinary Garden Podcast. I'm Chef Alan Barber. And I am Master Gardener Sarah Evans. So it's the middle of winter still, and there's not a lot of gardening we can do out in the garden. Uh, we have a greenhouse, but it's still pretty, pretty dormant in there. And we have some stuff growing inside that we've slowly been working on and harvesting. But there's really not a lot to do yet except for planning. So we're still in the planning stages. What sort of planning have you been doing this week? Mm, been doing a lot of thinking about what we're going to grow in the garden and where we're going to grow it. So uh, one thing in the fall that I did was measure out the backyard garden uh, by pacing it. So uh, walking around the yard and marking down how many foot footsteps I took and measuring that out as feet. And then I had a tape measure and I sort of double checked some of those measurements. And then I put those down on graph paper and drew a scale diagram of the garden. That's like pretty nerdy. That's like I know. Dungeons and Dragons maps or something. Yeah, it was very satisfying and uh, a little bit of a like math project, but but I think it worked out pretty well. And it was neat to see see the space and see the raised beds that are already there in the greenhouse and how big it is and then what available space we have around it. So <clears throat> we want to make more raised beds in our garden this year. Um, and we have the map and we have to make some decisions, I guess, like how big the gardens are going to be. Are they going to be raised beds or are they going to be just in the ground um yeah so what are the considerations that uh, we need to think about right now in order to sort of make those decisions so looking at how much space we have available is one important one and then uh looking at where it is in the yard so uh one thing in the yard is that there's a couple of spots in the middle that get a lot of daytime sun uh, that have sort of been taken up by some hascap bushes and those are really in like a primo spot uh, and they haven't been that productive and they've got quite large so i think the hascaps are getting the axe from the garden plan yeah i have to say like to me hascaps are the 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 container you know container buildings container sheds like when you take a sea container and you make it into something, hascaps are the sea container of the garden world. Right. Like there's for us here in the northern climate that we're in, hascaps are supposed to be a solution to a lot of problems and like, you know, a superfood and like it uh, right. matures super early. Super hardy, very trendy, very productive. But from our experience, uh, it's overrated, I yeah. think. I think my favorite thing about them is that they flower really early, and so there's always a lot of pollinators on them, which is really positive early in the spring. Uh, but other than that, they have fruited, but not really that much. And the fruit is, like, not super delicious. It's ugly. <laughs> I don't know. All fruit is kind of beautiful, but... And we've had some weird experiences, like, where... It's said a lot of, like, there's lots of pollinators and lots of flowers, and it's said a lot of fruit, and then there's just nothing, like, it just disappears. I don't know where it went, like, if something well, ate it or... Sometimes the birds, like, there was one day that uh, on the patio, somebody said, oh, wow, look, there's a cedar waxwing over there, and I was like, oh, wow, I haven't seen a cedar waxwing back here, like, since the winter, that's interesting. Then I thought, oh no, I just read something yesterday about how cedar waxwings love hascaps specifically. And I went over and there were two of them eating like all of the berries that were on the bush and the bushes were quite small at that point. So I don't know how they found it, but birds are pretty amazing that way. They will find what they are looking for and go for it. Yeah, I mean, the context of that story is there's a patio in our garden for the restaurant. And up until maybe the last... Uh, the garden that we have in our restaurant has a green space behind it that's surrounded by parking lots. It's in the little urban area of a small town. And when we purchased the building that we run our restaurant out of, there was basically parking back there. It was grass and asphalt, but there was really no garden. There was a really small, really old rhubarb patch and we've now been gardening back there for 12 years and we've really changed what's happening back there but 
birds really haven't gone into our little courtyard at all. So the idea that suddenly there's uh, wax wings eating all our house gaps is strange because we haven't seen a wax wing before that point. But flying over, they must have, I guess, smelled them. I'm not sure how they yeah. figured it. Yeah, and I think that's that's one thing that's pretty amazing about our garden is that we don't really have a lot of like pest pressure in terms of larger pests. Like a lot of people deal with groundhogs and deer and rabbits and and birds a lot more, and and we've been pretty lucky about that. I mean, we're not going to get deer in that yard. They'd have to jump over quite a large fence, but... No, you're more likely to get drunken college kids. That's true. Uh, so the hascaps are probably going to go... There's also... We, when when we first started... When we first started gardening in the... in the When we first started gardening in the courtyard, we met, came across an opportunity to purchase 10 apple trees for $10 each that were fairly mature, not too big, but like a couple years old. And we planted them, we planted an espalier, and then we randomly planted three other trees around the yard. One of them we got rid of a couple years ago, and now there's two left that are not part of the espalier, and they're just in the way. They are in the middle of the garden, and they're in places where we'd like to build beds. So we're gonna remove them, because apple trees are great, but they're not, they're a lot of work and they're not super productive compared to a small raised bed that's say growing greens or some other sort of fruit yeah. or vegetable. And that's really a lesson that we've learned is to be specific about where you plant things like trees. Like there's also two pear trees and they are quite large now and they're also very very productive we get lots and lots and lots of pears from them the last few years so they're worth keeping and they're the pear trees are 25 feet tall they're huge trees uh for the size of our backyard the apple trees are dwarf and they're about six feet tall yeah and that makes them really an awkward size because then they're sort of at head level they cast a lot of shade on the ground whereas the canopy of the pear trees are sort of higher up enough that uh they don't cast as much shade and yeah so thinking about where you're putting those trees is important in the early days but we're going to get rid of those too yeah it's also okay to change your mind and take down trees definitely uh, it's too bad because we've had them for six or seven years and they have produced fruit but it's challenging to like there's a lot of work goes into a fruit tree like an apple tree uh constant pruning and if you're going to try to grow organically in a really tight space like it's really hard like and these trees that we ended up with were fuji and honeycrisp and those trees they sat like they make beautiful fruit if you go to the grocery store and buy a honeycrisp apple but the amount of inputs that that fruit needs to be that perfect apple that you see in the grocery store, that's really hard to achieve organically as just someone who's gardening. And you know, you have to be you have to be an orchardist for that to, to pull that off. Definitely. And you have to use chemicals like organic or non-organic. You just can't not spray those trees and have them produce fruit that's at all appealing. Yeah. So instead of focusing on those other trees, what we're going to do is uh, look at the espalier that we have. And the espalier is really a beautiful, beautiful thing uh, up against a brick wall. And it does produce quite a few apples and they often do get pests on them and have some nutrient problems, but we can correct those more easily than we can focusing on the other trees as well. So, just... And if, you, if you're wondering what an espalier is, a two-dimensional apple tree, it's kind of six trees that are planted in a row like a fence, and then they're pruned and sort of woven together uh, to be two-dimensional, growing sort of not exactly against a brick wall, but about three feet away from a brick wall. We don't own the brick wall, it's the neighboring building, so we didn't wanna grow the trees right against it in case they needed to repair the brick. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, concept and a, and a fun way to grow a tree, but it's a lot of work. But We've put six or seven years into the espalier and uh, we don't want to get rid of it, but like we're willing to sacrifice the two random apple trees that are in the garden because they're just, 
they're 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 not worth it. Neither are the house caps. Right. So what are we going to put in their place? Raised beds. Raised beds. Yes. So this year we built quite a few raised beds, and we, before that we had we had been gardening and raised beds sometimes, and then we uh, had some in ground beds as well. But the raised beds have been really fantastic and productive, and we're going to go for more of those. Yeah. So. Raised beds are fantastic. There's a couple of issues that you have to think about if you're making raised beds. What are you going to make them out of? How big are they going to be? Where are you going to put them? And what are you going to fill them with? So, I mean, it's been quite a bit of deliberation and we really have been gardening in this space for 12 years and we've just started putting in raised beds. Like we've had a couple of them made out of scrap wood over time, which is where to answer one of the questions is like, is it worth making raised beds out of just scrap wood you have around? Uh, it is if it's a temporary thing. But Very temporary. They, we find that they only really lasted maybe three seasons if we're lucky, more like two before they really rotted out. So you can find other materials than scrap wood to make your raised beds out of, like different kinds of specific tree species that like hemlock or tamarack or cedar that are resistant to rotting. There's also treated lumber. And then there are some people are using galvanized metal. Uh, and then you could, I guess, do bricks or cements, mm -hmm. uh, stones. Different kinds of plastics sometimes people will use. And I guess it depends on where you live and how much money you have and what concerns you have. Definitely. And also how permanent they are. If you build something that's out of stone or masonry, then that is going to be there forever. Yeah. Well, not forever. But if you well, decide to change your mind about it, it's a pain in the arse to move it around. Exactly. Whereas if you have something made out of, you know, galvanized metal that's more easily picked up and moved around. Yeah. So then you know, we have to decide where to put them. So after having this space for a bunch of years, we have a good idea of where's sunny and where's not. And that's where we made the accident of like planting trees that are not very productive in the most, probably the best gardening spaces. So we have to decide to remove the trees and then we have to decide what to fill the beds with. Definitely. So a raised bed that's a couple of feet off the ground can use quite a lot of soil and you need to be able to get that soil from somewhere so what we did last year was we actually took apart some of our older raised beds and then transferred the soil into the new raised beds so that worked out pretty well we had sort of a an excess of it around yeah so you kind of have like two choices three choices one maybe four choices one is to use existing soil that you already have, uh, if you have it. If you don't, then you have to get soil from somewhere else. The other is to fill the beds with junk, like wood, leaves, grass, hay. A lot of people are into something called hugel culture, which uses wood or sticks. Um, and then you can order soil and get it delivered and dumped off the back of a truck or you can go to your home center and buy bags of soil and compost and peat. And all of those options have their positives and their negatives. And this is the time of year to sort of think these things through. Right. It's a lot easier than building the raised beds and then going, oh, crap, what are we going to do with these? Yeah. So the cheapest way to get soil into your beds is to call up someone who is a landscaping company who deals in organics and have them drop off soil that's garden soil yeah and you can not ask top them. soil but garden soil exactly yeah you need to ask them for something that's specifically a mix of soil for a garden and that has compost in it they'll often give you choices of like how much compost you're getting uh, if you have some existing soil around you could even get a pile of just compost from a company like that and then amend the soil that you do have and soil that comes from companies like that is delivered in the cubic yard and a yard is about the same dimension 
a cubic yard as a cubic meter, about three feet by three feet by three feet. In our garden, our raised beds that we're going to make this summer are about one foot by three high by three foot wide by three foot long. So three of those beds is going to be one cubic yard of soil. So we need for every three beds that we're making, we need one cubic yard delivered. If we get it delivered by the cubic yard. One issue that a lot of people might have is there's no way to get a dump truck mm. or a three quarter ton truck to dump soil. If you live in an urban environment or there's no way and you don't have the ability to wheelbarrow it or, you know, if you some places you might even have to carry it through your house to get to your backyard if you live in like a an old part of Halifax or something like that. So you need to figure out how you're going to get that soil in the back. And that's where bags of soil from the home center are helpful. Definitely, they're a lot more portable. They're a lot more practical in that uh, you don't have to deal with them all at once. Like often people will get a dump of soil on a tarp on their driveway, but then you have to park your car there. So you have to move the soil within a day or a weekend. And that's like- And if it rains. Can be a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. If it rains, it makes a big mess. Uh, so if you just, are building raised beds a few at a time, you can be going to the hardware store or the home center and buying bags of soil as you need them. And that's really good to do early in the season, I would say, because you're gonna have the best choice. Some people wait because they do go on sale later in the year, but I would say the biggest bags of soil usually disappear pretty fast and they're definitely the most economical so go out early and they'll often have sales early in the season too and and pick up what you need and plan ahead to to figure out how much you're going to use i think a lot of those soils that you get at the grocery store have a large component of peat which is really good for a starter garden especially if you're mixing it with something like uh, compost from your garden or compost that you got from a landscaper because it's really light and airy and uh, it really uh, works well in your garden. Yeah, we used some of the bagged soils and mixed them together. The nice thing about it is you can buy, you know, some like peaty soil and some compost and mix it together. If you get it from the organics company and they dump a dump truck full of stuff in your yard, uh, you may still have to amend that soil. It may not be what you were hoping it was. It's very, it varies depending on who the, the, the supplier is and what they have on hand. Uh, it's nice if you can go to their yard and see what they have, yeah. or you can see if a neighbor or someone around has had the stuff dropped off. But if you're dependent on the home center or the grocery store or you know your local garden center, uh, you can look and get a sense of what the material is like and you can mix it together and make things that are specific to whatever you're planting, like if you're planting carrots or... Yeah, definitely. You want more sand if you're planting carrots. If you're planting greens, you want it to be more peaty and aerated. Like you can really play around and, and figure it out. Um, as well, you can get bags of compost. I always used to buy bags of sheep manure. That was sort of my go-to um, from the grocery store. and. I've continued to buy those, but I've found a lot of the compost that you get the last couple of years have a lot of like what looks like wood waste material in it. So I was trying out different brands because the greenhouse gold I could get at the hardware store I found had a lot of sort of like wood chip in it. I'm not sure what the process is. And I think in some ways gardening got so popular in the last three or four years since the pandemic that I think probably there was a lot of pressure on some of those companies to produce more compost. That's just me guessing. Um, and so maybe it just ended up being less uh, high quality. Oops. Louder. Um, yeah. I, the other thing that you can add to your garden beds is uh, yard waste. So some things are better than others. Uh, you can add straw or leaves or grass clippings, which generally are pretty good at the bottom of your garden bed. Uh, maybe you could mix them in. I'm not sure if that's a great idea. Sarah can maybe address that in a minute. But then the other thing that's common, and Sarah touched on it by mentioning that a lot of the compost in the, in the bags lately has had a lot of wood waste in it, is hugel culture, where you use like cordwood or broken up branches and 
large pieces of, of wood basically at the bottom of your bed and then you cover it with some topsoil, which is supposed to, and in some cases does like add nutrients. But I think the experience that a lot of people have is that that wood decomposing takes a huge amount of nitrogen out of the soil. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it does add organic matter to the soil and definitely there's a lot of like uh, fungus and microbes and different little invertebrates that are actively working to decompose wood, which is really fantastic uh, and is going to improve your soil. But it's not a short term thing. It takes quite a while for that to happen. And uh, so it may throw your uh, garden soil into an imbalance. I'd say if people are doing like deeper raised beds, then adding a lot of woody material at the bottom with straw and with other kinds of like uh, yard waste or compost you have around is totally fine. But just make sure that you've got at least a good foot of soil on top that uh, is something that you feel confident you can grow plants in. And if you're converting like a big piece of lawn or just like some like land that's really got nothing going on on it then burying wood and covering it with a mound of earth is probably a great idea but in a small backyard or a culinary garden situation like we have the hugel culture is probably not the best way to go probably the best way to go is to for us we found over the years in our tight environment where we want to have a huge amount of productivity is to use raised beds with good amended soil in it not yard waste and to then compost and add composted yard waste on top of it over time to build up the sort of organic matter and the biome within that definitely and that's something that we've been doing more and more and why i think raised beds are working out really well in our yard is just adding material on top instead of worrying about digging in the ground and digging up uh, all the different soil structure that's there. So people talk about no-till. Are we no-till? Yeah, pretty much. I don't really dig uh, the beds. I mean, you can, no-till isn't like an absolute thing where you're never allowed to put a shovel in the ground. It's more like an approach where you add material on top and then plant into it and don't worry about the traditional double digging. When I did the master gardener training, it was interesting because a lot of it was about how to double dig a bed where you go through and you, you know, move all the soil out of the way for one shovel depth and then you do another shovel depth and then put it back uh, and mix it up with soil. And that's okay, but uh, if you have any amount of soil structure there, you're destroying it completely all the little air pockets, all the little wormholes, all the little uh, mycelium networks of all the fungus. So that's not good for the soil at all. Are you also like bringing seeds to the surface of weeds? Oh my God, yeah. That's one thing at the community garden uh, that we're involved with this summer. I'm really going to recommend that everybody use a no-till approach when planting their beds because people tend to add some compost and then dig up the bed because it's a nice like raised bed. The soil's quite rich and easy to dig but man because there's so many wildflowers and wild plants around that area it is so weedy like thousands and thousands and thousands of weed seedlings come up and they really will grow fast and they'll overwhelm the plots and it's hard because at a community garden you're not going out every day and looking at it and pulling a few weeds you you know go plant some things go back after two weeks and like in some cases you can't even tell where the beans came up because the weeds have just totally overtaken the whole plot so my idea this year is to just keep all those weed seeds in the soil and bury them underneath compost and plant into the compost and i'm hoping that that's going to be better we will see it would be a fun experiment to to try and maybe we'll dig up half a bed and then uh leave half a bed and see what it makes a difference because there's still going to be weed seeds that are flying around from the environment but definitely there's a lot in the soil already so uh what are we looking forward to in the week ahead in gardening oh the week ahead well i played with the soil blockers that i got today and i'm going to start to plant a couple of seeds not too many but i want to plant some lettuce seeds that we can plant into the greenhouse when it gets a little bit warmer so i want to keep those inside for about a like, month when, like how warm and like when do you suspect that will be 
Uh, I would say probably in mid-April. So if I plant them soon, well, early April. That's like two and a half months. Okay, yeah, I know. I mean, maybe get jumping the gun here. Yeah, don't jump the gun. That's a big lesson and something maybe we could end the show on this week is just like, it's really hard to not jump the gun. But like, if you plant your tomato seeds right now, you're just going to have leggy tomato plants. It's true. Okay, the other thing I was going to plant that's not too early to plant is parsley because parsley actually take up to a month to germinate. Right. So they're going to just sit there in the little tiny soil blocks and then they're just going to wait to germinate. And then once they germinate, then they could go out. But that will take a little while. So hold your horses, get out a piece of paper, draw your garden. Definitely make some plans, throw around some ideas. One thing that's exciting is like I went to the, the home center here in town the other day to get some plumbing parts and the winter the snow blowers are away the barbecues out the seeds are on the shelf the hose equipment the hose gear and the and the gardening stuff is back in the hardware store which is exciting that's uh, the first sign of spring is like nowadays even before the maple starts running the, the sap starts running in the maple trees the home center restocks the summer gardening section awesome i can't wait i can't wait either all right until next week i'm chef alan barber and i'm master gardener sarah evans and this is the culinary garden podcast toodly do